Well, I'm both delighted and honoured to be able to sit here today with Marlene Shikluna to interview her and talk to her a little bit about her life. Marlene, of course, is well known to the Maltese Australian community for her work on the SBS Maltese Language Program and on Maltese Down Under. And um, I was, of course, one of them, interviewed at least twice by Marlene. And this is my opportunity to get a little bit of revenge on you, Marlene, and uh, to uh, also turn the tables somewhat. What uh, prompted me to interview you, of course, Marlene, was some of the Facebook posts you put up recently about a fascinating family history. And to all of us, of course, in the Maltese Australian community, you'll always be known as Marlene Shikluna. However, there's also a Cassandra Davison living somewhere in the wings. And today is the time when we're going to find out a little bit more about both of those personas. Well, I'm sitting here um, and these two paintings here actually represent who I am. Um, I'm Indigenous by birth, I'm Aboriginal Australian by birth, but um, I'm Maltese by adoption. So I was born to an Aboriginal mother. Um, uh, my father is um, American with a German and Irish background. I was adopted from birth um, by this Gotterton or Maltese couple who were actually, who migrated to Sydney. My father was in, in, you know, in Australia for 40 years, my adoptive mum for 20 years. They adopted me in 1969 and um, have raised me as Maltese. So I always say that um, I'm Indigenous by birth, I'm Maltese by adoption, but my dominant culture is Maltese because that's where I was brought up. In Malta, um, in 1973, my adoptive parents went back to Malta, as a lot of Maltese did, yes. um, to retire, and that's where they retired. That's where I was raised. Mm. That's where I did all my education, mm. and that's why um, I took on the Maltese culture and the Maltese language. Marlene, this is one of the things that came up on Facebook that also intrigued me enormously. Not only was there this deep connection with Malta and the connection now with Australia, but suddenly out of nowhere appears this American family, this American connection. Would you like to tell us a bit about that? Mm. Um, thanks to DNA, you know, it's very trendy nowadays to mm. have your DNA done, isn't it? Um, DNA for me opened up a whole new world and um, I ended up finding my biological father's family. Um, and, you know, my mum, I only knew my biological father for a short time. He, he was American and he was in, stationed in Vietnam mm -hmm. and came on R&R &R to mm -hmm. Sydney back in 1968. Met my mum and this is the result of that meeting. Um, and she knew nothing about him. So when she gave me up for adoption, um, uh, she put him down obviously as unknown, um, but she did put down that he's American. Mm -hmm. And that's all I knew. I've spent years um, umming and ahhing whether I should be looking for my, searching for my biological father because, you know, as, as a mother, you know that you gave birth to a child. Right. As a father, he wouldn't know that he fathered a child back in 1968. So I wasn't sure whether to go looking as well for my biological father, but, I'm, you know, through DNA, I found my family and now I found that connection to America Right. but also why I look so European because actually his background is German on his father's side mm -hmm. and Irish on his mother's right. side right. going back generations. Yeah, right. I mean they've been, you know, his family migrated to America from Ireland and Germany in the 1600s, mm -hmm. 1700s, so really they're American but the ancestry is there. It sounds to me like there were four, at least four major earth-moving discoveries that you made at that point. The first, that you were adopted. The second, that you were in fact Indigenous Australian. The third, that you had this amazing American connection. And the fourth, in the use of your word was when relating to your biological father. That gives us a hint that something else had passed. Would you like to say a bit more about that? 
Yeah, um, having, you know, had this DNA done, um, um, I found my father's family, but unfortunately it was bittersweet because um, upon making contact with um, the family, I was told that he was murdered at the age of 20. So just after he came back from Vietnam, he went back to America and unfortunately was murdered there at the age of 20. When we talk about the fact that at the age of 20, your dad was in fact murdered, they might think, okay, well, was he involved in some sort of organized crime? But from what you have told me previously, it sounds like it was something completely accidental. Well, in reality, you know, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. It was a robbery and um, he unfortunately lost his life. You've now got this extraordinary relationship with three separate families. You've got your Maltese adoptive family who must have been significantly older than you because you talked about them moving back to, M to Malta to retire not long after you were born and they adopted you. You've got this relationship now with your indigenous mother that's suddenly appeared in your life and you also have this relationship with an extended American family that's consequently appeared in your life. I, I just wonder what all this means for you. For me, mom and dad are mom and dad, Esther and Michael Camilleri. Mm. Um, I've known them from the very first few days that I, you know, I came here on earth. Uh, and they'll always be mom and dad. Mm. They were the best parents one could have. They were very supportive, they were very loving. Um, they supported me through, um, I was very active in the um, arts in, in Shara and in mm. Gozo. Um, you know, I, I sang in song festivals, I was in stage productions, and they mm. were always there to support me. Right. Um, and they gave me a home, and they gave me love. Mm. So for me, they're my parents. And I was brought up in that culture. So even though I am not Maltese by blood, I don't even have Maltese citizenship, but um, my dominant culture mm. is Maltese. Mm. Now, you talk about your life in Gozo, a small community where everybody knows you. Now, the natural extension to that in Gozo is that everybody would probably know about you. Were there ever any hints from people who lived locally who knew you that everything may not be really as it seems? There were hints and actually they knew me as La Australiana, yeah, the Australian. Ah. But I thought because I was born in Australia and that's about yeah. it. Um, there were hints like we'd be at festas and mum would, you know, be stopped by people and, and them saying, oh, is this the little girl that you raised, not adopted, raised? So there were certain hints, but I never picked up on them, right. ever. So the discovery was made nonetheless. How did you actually find out? Well, I found out because I was always very investigative. Um, I was always looking into stuff, always, you know, fascinated by things and mum had this um, suitcase and she had a lot of stuff from Australia in it. One of them, you know, she had the wedding dress which like any little girl, you know, I'd go and put on that wedding dress and, and rummage through the suitcase to see what's in there. And just before my 16th birthday I happened to go up again looking for something, I don't know what, and I came across this envelope who, which I had never seen before and opened it up and it said in the order of adoption of Cassandra Davison and I'm thinking okay who's this Cassandra Davison and I open up that folder and it said to be known as Maria Carmel Camilleri that's me and I went what's going on I never heard of the word adoption up until then I didn't even know what adoption so was. At, at the age of 16 this is probably one of the most vulnerable and fragile ages for a young person where you're establishing your own sense of identity, and suddenly you've discovered that you're somebody else, somebody who you didn't really know. I wasn't the Marlene, because everyone called right. me Marlene anyway. So suddenly you were I cast. wasn't the Marlene Camilleri. Yeah. I'm Cassandra Davison. So who is Cassandra Davison? So how did you track back your birth mother, or did you make the effort to actually find her? When I was 20, I was about to give birth to my first child, and. Um, you know, you'd go f to the hospital for your doctor's visits and they would ask me, so, you know, what's your family medical history? And that's when I realised that 
I know nothing about my um, family medical history. I know nothing at all. And that's when it triggered that I do need to find out who I am, um, at least to get my medical history. Uh, so I started looking, um, I think I was pregnant with my second child by then. Um, and back then we were talking about snail mail between mm. Australia and Malta. Mm. It took me about five years to locate my um, birth mother, but I did. I'm very resilient. <laughs> um, I did find my birth mother. Um, it was a shock, actually, you know what was a shock? I think not as much as being adopted, it was a shock to know I'm indigenous. Because back then, um, you know, the picture that we had, especially in Malta, mm. of indigenous Australians or mm. Aboriginal Australians, mm. um, very primitive mm. natives. Mm. Uh, so for me, it was like when I saw on my papers that I was mm. Aboriginal, mm. I'm going to be honest, I looked in the mirror and I could just picture the, the photos in my encyclopedia, the World yeah. Encyclopedia, of how primitive Aboriginal Australian looked. And I looked in the mirror and I said, I look nothing like I that. See it. Mm. This is not me. How, mm. can, how can I be Indigenous? Mm. I can't be Indigenous. Mm. I look Maltese. Mm. <laughs> can't be Indigenous at all. So that was more of a shock back then. Mm. And um, I remember my mum wasn't that happy for me to say that mm. I'm Indigenous. Mm. Um, she didn't want me to say in public that I'm Indigenous, but because the mentality, especially when they were living in, uh, in Australia, mm. it was a colonial mentality, no, yeah? So um, the Indigenous and Aboriginal people yeah. were looked upon as an inferior race. Yeah. I don't see it that way. You yeah. know, it's such a rich culture and I'm so honoured and proud to have that culture in my blood. So then the, from the Canberra district, the tribe that you belong to would be the Ngunnawal tribe, which, which of course is the ACT and extends out into um, Yass and that ACT, part of New South Wales. ACT, yes, yeah, yeah. so, so um, that's right. So mm. my people, you always take your mother's mm. line. My mother is Ngunnawal. Yeah. Um, it um, includes uh, Canberra, Queanbeyan, Yass, yes. where my mum yeah. lives. Yeah. So those areas. Mm. And you know, the more I discover, I'm proud of, of, of my indigenous ancestors who were actually well respected, not just by their people, but also by, by the white settlers, by the, by the leaders mm. of their communities. So it was at that point that you made contact with the Davison family. I did. I wonder what it was like for your birth mum after all those years to have you re-establish contact with her? I think at first it was a bit of a shock. It took me five years to find her um, and it happened to happen at that particular point in time where my then husband and myself with our two children decided that I, I needed to come back home. Mm. I've always felt the connection. I belong to this land. And we were at that point in time where we, you know, the kids were still young and we thought it's now or never. Mm. And we took the plunge and I happened to find my birth mother just before we actually came here. Ah. Met, um, so we came in 1998 and went straight to Canberra to meet my mum. And it was very emotional, very emotional. I remember my former sister-in-law was actually filming the meeting and my birth mother came out and I came out of the car and we just um, went up to each other and hugged. And then we started, you know, you know we turned around, she must have invited me in. <laughs> we turned around and started walking towards mum's then home. And from the back, you could tell we walked the same way. <laughs> and for someone who's adopted mm -hmm. to see that, you know, similarity with mm -hmm. someone else, I never, you know, I look at my adoptive parents and I don't look anything like them. Mm. I look, although some people say I do, like my mum. Now all of a sudden I found this woman mm. who gave birth to me and I walk like her. That's major. That was the mm. biggest you know, thing for me. Is I'm, I'm always going, oh my God, we walk the same way. Mm. We sit the same way. We do have a bit of the same laugh. We, we've got a lot of things that are very similar. 
Um, but now, since I found my um, biological father's family, I can tell that I favour more them than I actually do my Davison side. So when you say you favour more, you're talking more about the look and In how looks. you look. Yeah. In looks, absolutely. Yeah. You showed me some photos of your dad and yourself when you were younger and also your boys, your sons, and there is quite a palpable resemblance, isn't there? So Cassandra Marlene, <laughs> With all of these extraordinary discoveries you've made in your life, how do these all impact on you now? What oh. does this mean for you? It means that I'm one of the luckiest people around, really, because I couldn't be more proud of my life and what it's become. Mm. You know, being born to, a, to an Aboriginal mum um, in this beautiful country of ours. Very proud of that, very proud of my ancestral history. Um, uh, um, you know, the best thing that she did was to give me up for adoption. Mm. And if that didn't happen, I wouldn't have had these opportunities in life like I, I do, mm. like I have had. Um, you know, growing up with my beautiful adoptive parents and in Malta, surrounded by that incredible history the Maltese Islands have mm. and the loving people that mm. the Maltese are really made me who I am. So it's, it's like a dough, yeah? Mm. I have the flour and the water, but if you don't need them together, nothing's going to happen. But Malta needed me in mm. who I am today. Mm. So um, I'm, I'm, I couldn't be luckier to have had, you know, being born in one of the most ancient civilization mm. in the world and then being brought up in in such an incredible rich history and culture mm. that Malta is and then finally finding out who my father is where I get my looks from mm. um, you know and tying in America and the European culture I couldn't be happier to see it all come together and have closure. From my perspective as a Maltese person, you have paid such honour in all of the things that you've done for the Maltese people here in Australia, our traditions and our cultures, that that will also never change and you will always be seen as one of us. Actually Andy, I would like to end on this to sort of bring my three cultures, or more cultures, but three cultures, three main cultures together. Thinking back to the years where, when I was with SBS, um, we had our business cards and on the bottom um, we had a one-liner that explains who we are or what we are about. And mine said, my soul is Aboriginal, my heart is Maltese because up until then I didn't know of this new culture that came in recently. And I can honestly say that my soul is really Aboriginal because I do belong to this land. My heart is Maltese because that's where I was brought up, that's where I was raised, that's the culture that made me me. And now I'm so excited to have this new world opening up to me, um, having my American family you know, come into that dough, into that need, and to learn more about my American culture by, through my father, but also the background, so the German and the Irish side, and you know, it's just, I just feel complete. Marlene Schkluner, Cassandra Davison, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today.